Before we get into this video, support your local queer, aka me, by checking out my Etsy store. They're double-sided, 100% wool felt Christmas tree decorations that if your cat bats it, it won't smash into a million pieces. My Etsy store is linked down in the description below. House of the Dragon star Emily Carey has deleted Twitter after a wave of fan backlash. The star came under fire for comments about her character, Alison Hightower. House of the Dragon star Emily Carey addresses queer baiting accusations. What is queer baiting and why was Kit Connor accused of it? Queer baiting accusations have led Heartstopper actor to take to Twitter to explain his sexuality to fans. Oh my god, the world has lost it. So today we're going to be talking about queer baiting and two specific cases of people being accused of queer baiting when, spoiler alert, they weren't. Congratulations everyone, you went after a 19 and an 18 year old for queer baiting when they're both queer and weren't baiting to begin with. Without any hesitation, let's get into the topic. Queer baiting is a marketing technique for fiction and entertainment in which creators hint at, but then do not depict, same-sex romance or other LGBTQ plus representation. The purpose is to attract an LGBTQ plus or straight ally audience with the suggestion or possibility of relationships or characters that appeal to them. The idea of queer baiting actually goes all the way back to the Hays Code. This was a self-imposed industry set of guidelines for all motion pictures that were released between 1934 and 1968. If you would like a more in-depth explanation of the Hays Code itself and queer baiting, I recommend this video by Rowan Ellis, they do a really good in-depth explanation of it. But basically, what this meant is that it forbade many different types of things being seen in media. For example, suggestive nudity or same-sex relationships. So it left people who wanted to see those things having to find loopholes around it in order to get that kind of representation and tell the stories that they wanted to. Unfortunately, because same-sex relationships were very, very bad back then, they had to find ways in order to show it that would still be, quote, moral, unquote. This meant that any depictions of same-sex relationships were either very suggested at and not explicit, or if they were explicit, they had to be followed by a consequence. For example, a character being punished for their homosexuality and seeing it as a negative thing. A modern day equivalent to the Hays Code is China's morality code of what can and can't be seen in media. You can see this in more detail in my video on anime that abandoned China. However, the Chinese government are extremely inconsistent with applying these rules. The webcomic and anime series Tianguan Sufu has not been banned in China despite it depicting effeminate and gay men. Genshin Impact hasn't been banned in China and it has quite a few effeminate male characters. Have you seen Sing Chiu or Venti recently? They would be considered effeminate men by the CCP standards. And lesbian Chinese pop star Tiao Tiao released her song I Bu Fen, Love Does Not Discriminate, and the CCP also has not attempted to suppress the song. So it's like, haze code, but they don't really care about it too much. Just say it's there and then they look, quote, moral, unquote, but don't do too much about it, I guess. Evidently, the haze code has now been abandoned in Hollywood. However, creators of TV and movies now see the potential that suggesting queer relationships has without having to show it. They can draw in LGBTQ plus viewers without having to have the actual payoff that would turn off those who are hmm, homophobic. There are, however, exceptions to the queer baiting rule. Adventure Time is one of them. Bubbleine, the relationship between Princess Bubblegum and Marceline, is not queer baiting. They always had the intention to have Bubbleine be canon in the story. But there were a lot of problems when it came to the creators of Adventure Time and their intention to show Bubbleine throughout the show as canon, and the wants of the distributing networks who didn't want to show that kind of content on a children's television show. The hints of Bubbleine being a thing throughout the show, for example, Bubblegum's most prized possession being a t-shirt that Marceline gave her and Bubblegum having a picture of them taped to the inside of her wardrobe. These weren't queer baiting aspects. They were the creator's ways of trying to let the audience know that there was something more between Marceline and Bubblegum 
without breaking the terms in which the distributing networks had placed for them. And as soon as they were allowed to, they officially made bubbling canon in the show. Examples of real queer baiting include Sherlock and Supernatural. You can go and watch Sarah Zed's videos on the topics to get an understanding as to why. So let's get on to these recent claims of queer baiting and I will explain to you why they aren't. Emily Carey made some comments regarding her character in House of the Dragon, Alice in Hightower. One of those was that she had created a backstory for her that made her less of a villain. I'll be going over the backlash to these comments in my review of House of the Dragon and why Emily Carey is absolutely 100% right, considering Alice in Hightower was a teenager at the time the story kicks off. However, there were other things within the show that some people thought to be queer baiting. Emily herself believed that there might be something between Rhaenyra and her character, Alicent. This was based on Emily's interpretation of the script that she was given. She didn't add anything to the script. She didn't change anything in the scenes. As a queer woman herself, she read through the script, she looked at the scenes and said, I think there might be an interpretation of this that could hint towards something more being between Rhaenyra and Alicent. Here is going to be a minor spoiler for House of the Dragon. Alicent discovers that Rhaenyra spent the night with her uncle Daemon in a pleasure house, and there's a rumour that they got intimate together. Alicent confronts Rhaenyra on the basis that this will ruin her virtue. It threatens Rhaenyra's prospects of finding a suitable husband, an honourable husband, because no one will want to marry Rhaenyra if she has lost her maidenhood. And this is the premise in which Alicent confronts her and wants to know if these rumours are true. The subtext behind this that they found was, perhaps it wasn't just that, perhaps it was jealousy. Perhaps Alicent wanted to be with Rhaenyra. It's nothing that Alicent or Rhaenyra say to each other that indicates this, it's the acting, it's the subtext and the way that they go about it. There are also other scenes that indicate intimacy between Rhaenyra and Alicent. For example, the scene where Rhaenyra is lying with her head in Alicent's lap. You can read this in many different ways. It could be two best friends sitting on the ground just talking to each other. It could be hinting towards something more. It just so happens that when these two young actresses talk to each other about the script, they read between the lines and interpreted it to be something more, which makes sense considering, as I've mentioned before, Emily is queer herself. No one was promising a relationship between Alison and Rhaenyra and if you were paying attention to the show, you would know that would be impossible. And I think this subtext adds another layer of tragedy to the story. Both Alison and Rhaenyra are in a patriarchal society and some people argue that Rhaenyra is this feminist icon that is going to break the wheel just like Daenerys wanted to but Honestly, she doesn't, and I can link another video in the description that explains why she's not, because there are times that Rhaenyra uses patriarchal concepts in order to benefit herself. Which is why the entire argument that Alicent bad because she adheres to the patriarchal society and Rhaenyra good because she's this punk rock rebel who's going to break the wheel isn't an accurate view of what we're being told in both the book and the show. While it's a valid interpretation of the book and the show, it's not a realistic interpretation of the book and the show when you're looking at greater societal construct. I think the interpretation that Emily saw adds even more depth to the characters themselves, because it can never happen. These girls, one daughter of the king, one daughter of the hand of the king, Alongside the blatant homophobia, it also adds context to why Rhaenyra reacts to certain situations shortly after this confrontation in the way that she does. I won't spoil that part, but while they're both still young and it's still Emily and Millie playing Alison and Rhaenyra, there are certain things that happen and it adds an even greater depth to why Rhaenyra reacts the way she does to those events. It makes it even more sad. And I think you would only ever pick up on this subtext if you were queer or if you were keyed into queer context or queer coding. It wasn't a selling point of the show. You weren't promised a relationship between Alison and Rhaenyra. It was subtext that was given that some people would pick up on and give them a greater understanding of the character 
and give the character greater depth. And both of those girls being married off to men wasn't the punishment for those feelings, it was the reality of the world that they lived in. Emily Carey should not have to explain as a queer woman why she interpreted the text in the way that she did, and she did not queer bait. So let's stop with that. The next case in this video is a little bit more complicated because I don't know why Kit Connor was accused of queer baiting. I've read so many different articles and I think I've picked up on some of the points, but it's so confusing. Kit Connor played Nick in Heartstopper, a rugby player who later finds out that he's bisexual. Kit, who had previously not disclosed his sexual orientation, was seen holding hands with a female co-star in Paris, and this means that he's queer baiting? I'm sorry, what? First of all, Kit, regardless of his sexuality, is playing a bisexual character, and as a bisexual myself, I don't think it's queer baiting if an actor plays a character of a different orientation. I can't speak on behalf of every single bisexual person, nor can I speak on behalf of those who come from other sexual orientations or gender identities, but I myself do not care. Kit could be 100% straight, playing a bisexual man, and I would not care, because what I care about is that character is portrayed in a respectful way, and that the acting is good. While I understand that representation for LGBTQ plus actors is important, I would so much rather have a straight actor playing a bisexual character well, than a bisexual actor playing a bisexual character really badly. While I might not be able to relate to bisexuality or being in same-sex relationships, it's not about the actor, it's about the character. They are played to portray someone who is not them, that is the point of acting. Sometimes bisexual and gay actors also don't want to be pigeonholed as playing the bisexual and gay character all the time. Sometimes they also don't want to have to relive scenes that involve homophobia because it impacts them. Sometimes people aren't just their sexualities. Kit got harassed so much that he spent six months off of social media just to recently come back and say, just letting you guys know, I am bisexual. You harassed an 18 year old kid to the point where he had to come out. I think some people spend so long online that they confuse what is and isn't problematic, what is and what isn't a big deal. And in these cases, people just need to relax and realize it's not that deep. Adding some queer subtext to a narrative is not queer baiting. An actor playing a bisexual character without disclosing their sexuality publicly is not queer baiting. These people need to turn off the phones, get off the computers, go outside, stop being so terminally online and realise there's more to life than harassing an 18 year old boy who hasn't disclosed his personal private sexuality because he clearly wasn't ready to come out with that which was the point of the show. Before I get too heated, to summarise, I like the perspective that Emily had when it came to House of the Dragon and the narrative. I like that queerness we have not seen before. It's a nuanced take on queerness and it's an opt-in perspective. You don't have to see Alison and Rhaenyra's relationship as romantic. You don't. You can see them as just being friends. But for those of us that might see something more, it's there and it adds more tragedy and sadness and death because it's never going to happen. Look at the story that you are watching and realise it is not going to happen because it is set in a patriarchal homophobic society that has placed specific value on women and expectations on what women can and can't do. That is the point of the story and the entire point of why there's a problem with Rhaenyra ascending to the throne to begin with. I don't have a problem with any person of any sexual orientation acting out somebody else who is of another sexual orientation because that's the point of acting and I don't think we should be profiling actors based on their sexual orientations. That sounds a bit segregatory and limiting for certain actors and I don't think that we should be making wild assumptions 
of the sexuality of 18 year old and um also just a quick interjection in this if you're assuming that somebody is straight because they hold hands with somebody of the opposite sex that is bisexual erasure which is actually what you were doing now that kit has stated he's bisexual you are adding to the problem of bisexual erasure and the imposter syndrome that bisexuals feel every time they enter lgbtq plus spaces because they're constantly made to feel not queer enough you're a problem go and fix yourself that's all for this video, remember to check out the recommended content and if you want more of me you can check out my Etsy store and my Patreon. I'll see you guys in the next video, bye!